Good morning, everybody. I hope that you are having a good day, a good morning. Um, here it's a little, a little rainy, but um, I guess all of that sunshine we had, the, the uh, grasses, was thank, thanking the Lord this morning it could have some rain. Um, so it's good to be with everybody this morning. Um, as we had said yesterday after our um, Bible study, yet, or excuse me, our book reading yesterday, um, that today we're going to talk about the foundation, um, that everything um, that we build upon, uh, whether it be a house or whether it be our relationship with God, has to start on a good foundation. And I tell you, today is going to be one of those ones that I believe is going to challenge everybody. So I'm going to encourage you again, um, if if you um, know somebody, uh, go ahead and start a watch party. Maybe uh, you'll have others that may uh, chime in and watch it. But this is one of those ones I think that once once you're we're done, I believe that you will honestly desire to have others um, hear it. It is it's absolutely amazing. Um, so let's let us pray real quick, and then we will get right into this. And I'm looking forward to to reading this to you today, Father. I thank you for another opportunity. I thank you for the beautiful day that you have created, Lord. Lord, I'm I'm so thankful, Father, to have the opportunity to read this book. Lord, I'm so thankful for those that. Um, actually uh, take time out of their schedule uh, to come and to uh, listen and to learn and to gleam. And I just pray, Father God, that you would touch our hearts, that you would touch our ears um, and allow us to hear and apply this to our lives. Allow this not to just fall on stony ground, but allow it to truly fall and make root into our hearts, Lord. Um, and let us not just get it in our knowledge, but Lord, let us take it deep into, into our hearts. And so, Father, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. I thank you, Lord, uh, for all the blessings. And I thank you, more importantly, for just the opportunity uh, to do the calling that you have called me to do, to be a pastor and, and to be a, a teacher of the Word of God. And I'm so thankful for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to get started again on our book. For those that have maybe not have been with us, we are now in chapter 4 of Good or God by John Bevere, Why Good Without God Isn't Enough. And as we have said day in and day out, I do not want to settle for just enough. Um, I don't want to settle for good. I'd rather have what God has for me. Um, I want to be able to have God's best for my life. And so I'm really, it's, it's just exciting um, for, I'm really looking forward to what we're going to be learning today. Okay, so starting in chapter number four, and the title of this chapter is called The Foundation. The godly have an, a lasting foundation, Proverbs 10 and 25. If you believe in the gospel, what you like, and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. That's an interesting thought. I'm going to read that one more time. If you believe in the gospel, what you like, and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, it's yourself. Hmm. That was actually a quote from St. Um, Augustine of a, 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 a Hippo. Let's begin. It says, let me restate the three facets of this book's message. The first speaks to our foundation. The second addresses what holds our lives together, and the third represents the building of our lives. These aspects will be the focus of our discussion for the remainder of this book. The foundation is critically important to a correct relationship with God. If you're a longtime believer, I strongly suggest not skipping over the concise discussion that follows. It'll be beneficial not only to shore up your groundwork, but also to help those you lead or influence in a relationship with the Creator. And I'm telling you, I've already read it, and it is definitely something, Never, if, if you're a believer for a long time, I think it's going to give you a, a really cool insight to how to share um, the gospel, uh, how to create a foundation for those that God uh, brings into your path to, to create a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is, I believe, a message that we all need to hear because it helps us to set the proper foundation 
um, for a person to create a relationship with Jesus Christ and with God, the Father. But it also helps us to understand whether or not we ourselves are deceived or those that you know around you that are deceived. Um, and so it's such an incredible, um, incredible chapter, this, this chapter. So please take it to heart. Alrighty, it says, we are told, the scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. That's Romans 3, 10 through 12. No one does good, not a single one. Other than Jesus Christ, there is not one human being who has ever lived or ever will live who will consistently did or does good according to God's evaluation. And we talked about God's evaluation and our evaluation yesterday. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to, to be with us, you can go back um, on Lancaster uh, Church of God's Facebook page, hit videos, and it has all the videos that we have done preaching-wise from all of those that are in our leadership team every night at 7 o'clock, um, all of the book readings, all of the messages that I do on Sunday. So it's all there for you. Let's continue. It says, Adam and Eve died the moment. I'm sorry, let's go back up here to, uh, to this uh, other chapter, or other, excuse me, other paragraph. It says, the reason for this, every human being was born a slave. Yes, we were born a slave. And so was I. A slave of what, you may ask? Sin. Paul writes to those who've been freed. Once you were slaves to sin, Romans 6 and 17, Adam and Eve died the moment they disobeyed God. God warned of this fate before they, had for, they ate the forbidden fruit. However, it was years before either experienced a physical death. This brings up the question, how did Adam and Eve die the day they ate the fruit? Death occurred in their core nature, their spirit. They were separated from God, the giver of life, and now had inherent attributes co contrary to his. Consequently, their descendants would be born with the same inherent qualities, which would be passed on from generation to generation to this day. Genesis 5 and 3 conforms confirms this reality. When, when Adam was 130 years old, he had a son who was just like him, his very spirit and image. So as we see there in scripture, that, that was in Genesis 5 and 3, that when uh, Adam had a son, he had his very same spirit and his very same image. Humankind was now incapable of truly knowing and practicing good, the internal moral compass had been compromised. Consequently, only the influence of God on earth would steer human beings towards what is truly good and right. For man was now governed by sin. Without divine guidance, good and evil were distorted. The new Lord and chief influencer of humanity was now he who had possessed the serpent, Satan, the king of disobedience. <clears throat> the earth had been given to humankind by God. He had put them in charge of it, but they had delivered their authority to Satan. And I want us to get that. Adam and Eve had to give authority over to Satan. God gave them the authority of the garden and to maintain it, and they willingly gave it over to Satan. Thousands of years later, the devil took Jesus to a high mountain, pointed out the earth, and boldly stated... All this authority I give you and their glory. For this has been de delivered to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Luke 4 and 6. Now we know this is when Jesus was being tempted by Satan when he came out of the wilderness. But notice what he said there. He said, for this has been delivered to me. He has the ability. Satan does have the ability and the authority over this present world. Why? Because Adam and Eve gave it to him. And I know this isn't part of the book, but in our lives, we have to give Satan the authority in our lives. Do y'all understand that? Especially as believers. Because Jesus, as we're going to learn here in a few minutes, he took back that authority. 
And you and I can live victorious unless we continue to give Satan the authority in our lives. It says Satan was able to save such, say such a thing because his rulership had been delivered to him in the garden. God couldn't come to the earth in the form of deity to rescue us because the earth had been given to humans. Humankind relinquished authority. Only a human being could take it back. I want y'all to think about that. God came up with a, a plan long before Adam's transgression as he foresaw Adam's choice bef before time began. He strategized to, co to come as a man and purchase back humanity's freedom for slavery. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman who made him 100% man, but conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, which made him 100% God. Therefore, Jesus was free from the curse of slavery you and I were born under. Jesus lived a perfect life on earth. He never committed one disobedient act. Now, I like the word he uses there. Jesus did not commit one disobedient act. See, a lot of times we think of sin by what it is we do and we give it a title. But the truth of the matter is sin was the first sin that was ever done was disobedience. As we read a minute ago, Satan is the king of disobedience. And I love how he put that there, that Jesus did not commit one disobedient act. So in our daily lives, the sin that we do is our disobedience. Think about that for a moment. As the only innocent human being who had ever lived, he gave his life for the freedom of, man, of humankind. On the cross, he took the judgment of every man and woman who'd already lived, was living, or would live in the future. He shed his royal blood as the payment to liberate us from sin. Praise God. He died and was buried. Since he had lived a perfect life before God, the Spirit of God raised him from the dead three days later. He is now seated at the right hand of God Almighty, who has made this decree. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10 9 through 10. The moment we receive Jesus as Lord, an amazing miracle occurs. Our nature of sin and death instantly passes away and a brand new person is born, created in the very image of Jesus. This fresh birth pertains to our spirit, our real being, not our physical body. Our physical body is still corrupt and will one day pass away. New life comes entirely through the gift of God's grace and is no way attached to any good behavior or merited by any work we've done, period. It's important to point out that the scriptures from Romans quote, quoted above states we must confess the Lordship of Jesus, not the Savior Jesus. I want us to remember that. In that scripture, it, we must confess the Lord Jesus not the Savior Jesus. Herein lies a fundamental flaw prevalent in this Western church. The word Lord is the Greek word curious, which means master, owner, supreme in authority. To confess Jesus as merely Savior doesn't bring freedom or new life. Did y'all get that? I got to say that again. To confess Jesus as merely Savior does not bring freedom or new life. I realize this is a strong statement that cuts against the grain of our accepted appeal to lost, but it is true to Scripture. The word Savior is found 36 times in the Bible. The word Lord occurs 7,800 times. Did y'all get that? The word Savior is found 36 times in the Bible. We're not talking New Testament. We're talking Bible. The word Lord occurs 7,800 times. 
Where do you think God places the, the emphasis? Lord declares the position he holds in our lives. Whereas Savior describes the work he's done for us. And I'm going to tell you something. When I read that this morning, God gave me a, a complete revelation. And I'm telling you, that's what I meant earlier by no matter how long you've served God or how much you've read God's word, today's going to be a, a word that you need to share with somebody. Because it even started transforming even me revelation. Because I never really thought about it that way. That the Lordship, that, that, held, that shows or describes or declares the position that God has in my life. Savior describes the work that he did. That's interesting. It says we cannot partake of the benefits of his work unless we come under the position as Lord and King. Do you get that? You cannot reap the benefits of the work he did until you come under the lordship or under the position of his lordship in your life. We were born slaves. Simply put, sin owned us. However, we have been created with a free will. Therefore, we must make a firm decision and declaration that we're changing masters. Do you get that? We have to make a de declaration today and a decision today that we are changing masters. We're no longer going to be under the master of sin. Salvation has been provided for every human being. But as individuals, we have to choose to accept it under God's terms. Hmm. The island prison camp. I'll use a fictional story to explain this truth. On a certain island, their, their entire family, excuse me, I'm going to try that again. On a certain island, your entire family is in the prison camp of an evil lord. This land has originally been given to your grandfather by a very good king from a distant country. However, your grandfather made a huge mistake. He didn't guard it. The evil lord and his gang of rebels came by stealth, by stealth and took over the island, making your grandfather and all his descendants slaves. The evil lord and his cohorts then built prison camps and put your entire family behind bars. The way of life on the island, which progressively took on the nature of the evil lord and his cronies, decayed to a total corruption and debauchery. Consequently, the good king condemned the island. However, due to the love the king has for your family, before annihilating the island, he, he came and fought against the evil lord's army and defeated them. The king then throws open every prison door and declares all prisoners are now free. Any of you can walk out of the prison camp if you renounce the evil Lord's rule and give your alliance to me or your allegiance to me. Due to the king's kindness, your family's longed for liberty has come. However, the good king will not force you to follow him. Each prisoner has to make the move. If the king required it, rather than give each person a choice, it would simply be another form of tyranny. If you decide to embrace liberty, that choice requires that you walk out of your cell, follow the king to his ship, sail back to his country, become one of his subjects, and live by the laws of his great country. The opportunity is put before you, but you must agree to his terms. The good king is viewed as the savior of your family. However, to benefit from his saving work, each family member has to agree to submit wholeheartedly to him, which includes submitting to the laws of his reign. Not one of the prisoners in your family can merely accept the, Lord, the, excuse me, the king's salvation from the island, yet not submit to his lordship. If you choose not to follow the good monarch, you'll simply stay where you are. However, the king's battleships are stationed just off the shore, ready to bomb and annihilate the 
condemned island once he leaves. Those in your families who choose not to come under the lordship of the good king will suffer the same fate as the evil lord and his gang, even though the king battled to free all of you and throw open the prison doors. Hear me, dear reader. God never created hell for you or any other human being. He created it for Satan and his angelic troops. Jesus will judge on judgment, excuse me, Jesus will say on judgment day to those who did not give themselves to his sovereignty, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25 and 41. Hell is a very real place. I've got to say that again. Hell is a very real place. Jesus spoke more frequently of it than he did heaven. Did y'all get that? Jesus spoke more frequently of hell than he did heaven. He didn't seem mentioning it. It's he, excuse me. He he didn't see mentioning its description, the torment involved, as well as the fact that it was never ending as a lack of compassion. Notice that. When Jesus spoke of hell, he never saw that of a lack of compassion. When he described it, he never saw that as a lack of compassion. It's the eternal home of the dead who reject his loving rule. According to Jesus, this place of punishment an excruciating anguish wasn't prepared for human beings, but sadly, by his disobedience, our father Abraham included us in condemning judgment. Now Satan's fate is our fate unless we change lords. Even though Jesus rescued all mankind from God's wrath, many will be judged with Satan, for they will still possess his nature. In essence, they chose to stay on the island. Did y'all get something there? We talked about even, uh, I preached on a Sunday, we talked about, I think it was yesterday in the book, about once we are born again, God's nature, the, the seed of God is planted in us when we are born again. I preached this Sunday. And what we have to understand, unless you are born again, and unless the seed of God and the nature of God is supernaturally transformed into your life or, or planted into your life. You continue to have the nature of Satan. And that is actually what will be punished in these last days are those who possess the nature or those that are sons and daughters of Satan. Those are the ones that will be cast into this fire. And that's what we have to understand. God is judging those who who choose to continue to live and to have the nature of their father, Satan, and refuse to accept the free gift of salvation so that they can be born again with the nature of God and be reconciled to God through his son, Jesus Christ. Whew, what a message. What a message. In essence, they chose to stay on the island. You may ask, why couldn't God just be merciful and allow people into his kingdom just as they are? Now, I want you to think about that. How many songs are pre or sung that says, God wants you just as you are? He doesn't want you just as you are. You can come to him just as you are, but you have to be changed. You have to be transformed. It says, those who don't give themselves to the ownership of Jesus still possess a spiritual nature that is corrupt and evil. Once they leave this earth, that nature is theirs forever. Did y'all get that? Once they leave this earth, their nature, this, excuse me, that nature, Satan's nature, is theirs forever. An evil and corrupt nature. That's why it's so important that we share this message today. That's why it's so important that we live it out and we share the gospel with people that that. Um, are around us that don't know Jesus Christ because they don't understand that they have a nature that is evil and that is corrupt and they're born with it. It's so important. 
if, per, if permitted into the everlasting kingdom of God, they would pollute and bring harm to many innocent people. It was for this very reason God sent Adam and Eve away from the tree of life in the garden. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take fruit from the, from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 22 through 23. God, God's love protected us from maintaining a death nature permanently. Now think about that for a moment. When they were possessed with that death nature, had they reached out and ate from the tree of life, they would have lived forever in that state. Some would sit there and say God didn't show love by banishing them from the Garden of Eden, but it shows right here that God's love for us by banishing them out gave them an opportunity for Jesus to come and them to be reconciled back to the Father. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, there is some, there is some revelation nuggets in here that's absolutely amazing. God's love protected us from maintaining a death, a dead nature permanently. Lordship. Because the Western church has emphasized the work of Jesus did for us as Savior rather than his position as Lord, lack of submission to his position of authority creates a significant fault in our foundation. Did y'all get that? Because the church today puts more emphasis on the work that Jesus did rather than his position as Lord, the church and people's foundation of salvation has been faulty. In Colossians 2, 6 and 7, it says, As you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Jesus is our foundation. Paul doesn't, doesn't state, as you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, our, our lives must be submitted to and built upon his position of lordship not upon his work of, as Savior. I'm going to read that again. Our lives must be submitted to and built on his position as lordship and not upon his work as Savior. Another way of saying this is that we submit to him as our supreme and only king, then we benefit from his salvation. This plays out practically by our firm adherence to his word, wisdom, counsel, directives, correction, and instruction, whether we see the reason for it or not. We no longer feed from the tree of our own evaluation of what is right and wrong. We live in him. His life becomes ours. Consider this. Over the three dec decades of my marriage to Lisa, I've re received the benefit of living with a great chef. Lisa is magnif magnificent at creating gourmet meals. I've had friends who have asked Lisa if she'd teach their wives how to make pesto sauce and salad dressings and other savory delights. I have sometimes referred to Lisa as my little gourmet chef. I may have called her this a dozen times or so throughout our marriage, but more properly in the past 30 years, I've referred to her thousands of times as my wife. Why? Because that declares the position she holds in my life. The other title conveys a benefit I've received from her being my wife. Just because Lisa cooks for me doesn't mean I belong to her. When I was single, on one of my birthdays, she made me an amazing meal that didn't give, give us a lasting relationship. It was the covenant I made to forsake all other girls and give my heart wholly to her as a husband that solidified our marriage relationship. 
Our relationship with Jesus is similar to this. In order to receive his work of salvation, we must submit to his lordship, ownership, and reign. We give our lives completely because we are confident of his perfect leadership, character, and love, and that he knows what's best. Though he in, in, intentionally desires our freedom and loves us perfectly, he is the king of all kings and lord of all lords and will not come into our lives as second to anything or anyone else. Jesus will not come into your life or my life second to anything or anyone. Countless times in churches in America and other Western countries, I've witnessed ministers offer salvation to seekers without mentioning lordship. All you have to do is confess Jesus as Savior and you'll be a child of God. The, minister, the ministers have said, or why don't you make Jesus your Savior today? Or let's just all pray this prayer. Jesus, come into my heart and save me today. Thank you for making me a child of God. Amen. All their calls to join the family of God are offered without a single word about forsaking the world system and one's own independent way in order to follow him. Hmm. Sounds a lot like my sermon on Sunday. This message seems good and is isolated scripture in the New Testament. However, does it line up with the overall instructions of the New Testament? Is it God's wisdom? Or have we abbreviated, abbreviated, excuse me, and edited the true salvation message to come up with one that sounds good and appeals to the desires of seekers? Are we feeding from the tree of our own evaluation? I tell you, that script, that last sentence, are we feeding from the tree of our own evaluation? And I've, you've, you've heard me say this, anyone who's been around me long enough, this is one of my pet peeves of how easily we try to make salvation. It is easy. It's a free gift. But it costs us our lives. It's very clear. We have to make Jesus Lord of our lives. We have to submit. We have to repent. It's not just about Savior. He has to be Lord. Amen? Deny yourself. Let's look at the master's message. Jesus made it clear to the multitudes. Whoever desires to come after me, that's Jesus, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. We must deny ourselves if we are to follow him, period. What does this mean? Simply put, you cannot serve two masters. For you can only be loyal to one if each calls for a different action or response. I love that that. that comment right there. You can only be loyal to one if each calls for a different action or response. If you're serving two masters, you've got to choose which one you're going to respond to. Hmm. When our flesh, which is still unredeemed, desires one thing and the word of God desires us a different way, if we have not already chosen to follow Jesus as our supreme master then we can easily choose our independent way while still looking to and confessing him as Savior. It is possible we are misled in embracing this belief. Perhaps this is why Jesus said, So why do you call me, keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do as I say? Luke 4, 6 and 46. In other words, Lord, be, becomes a empty, meaningless title. I'm going to say that again. In other words, the word Lord becomes an empty, meaningless title. If we really don't mean it when we say Lord, Jesus would rather us call him great teacher. 
At least then we can benefit from his teachings and not be deceived into thinking we belong to him when in fact we do not. Hmm. According to Matthew, excuse me, according to Mark 8, 34 through 35, which is what we just read, and many other scriptures in the New Testament, the denying of ourself is not optional in regards to following him off the island of this condemned world. It's mandatory in order to be saved from the wrath to come. Hmm. I've discovered this is a difficult concept for Westerners to grasp. I believe the reason for this is that we are a people trying to understand kingdom principles with a democratic mindset. I want y'all to really get this. This is really a, a, a nugget here. Democracy has worked in America in other Western countries. But if we try to relate to God with a de democratic mindset, we will not connect. He's a king, a real king, not a figurehead monarch like one in England. Democracy is defined as government by the people, a form of government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised directly by them or by their elected agents. This is the mentality we have raised, we are raised with in America and other Western countries. It's programmed into our core thinking and our reasoning. Subsequently, if we don't like something, we believe we can challenge or change it because we have inalienable personal rights and freedom of speech to re express our views. Let me reemphasize, this form of government has been successful for the United States because it's a system de designed by mortal men living in a polaristic society. Pluralistic society, I'm sorry. But these ideas can't carry over to the kingdom of God. It may make us Westerners wince, but God is a dictator. Thankfully, he's a a benevolent one, but he has the final say in all aspects of life. Now, I know that's an interesting, as he says, Westerners wince at the word that God is a dictator. But the truth of the matter is, as he said, he has the final say in all aspects of life. He does. He has the final say of where we go. As we read in the Fear of the Lord book that we just got done reading, and if you didn't get a chance to, to you know, read that one with us, it's on our, on our website as well, in Lancaster Church of God. Um, I'm sorry, not website, but Facebook under videos. But in the Fear of the Lord, he has the final aspect of life. Even Jesus said, don't worry about the one or fear the one who can harm the body, but fear the one who can harm the body and also condemn the soul to hell. God has the final authority on everything. But whether or not you make him Lord is your, that's your, that's, that's your choice. Amen? If we carry our de democratic mindset into our walk with God, we'll have nothing more than a make-believe relationship. Life is different under a true monarch. Lord and king are synonymous with the aspect of carrying the meaning of supreme in authority. If we are going to truly follow God, we simply cannot use democratic reasoning in the way we respond to his leadership. It's no different than when Eve and Adam chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We human beings are still in the driver's seat and decide what we think is best for our lives. Take up your cross. Next, Jesus declares that we should take up our cross. What does that imply? It can't mean to deny ourselves, for why would Jesus repeat himself unnecessarily? We find the key in Paul's letter to the, to the Galatians, where he states, this is Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Paul was not speaking of physical crucifixion, for if if he wouldn't if if so he wouldn't have been able to write this letter. He's referring to his decision to follow the masters years earlier. Paul had taken up his cross. The secret of what this had entailed is found in his words. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. <clears throat> this should be the declaration of every true child of God. Amen. No longer are we independent, feeding from the tree of our evaluation of what is good and evil. No, we now live in him. Our very life is drawn from him. We depend on the provision of the cross, freedom from slavery, so we can now live an obedient life empowered by God. Did y'all get that? What did the cross do for us? It gives us the freedom from slavery so that we can now live an obedient life empowered by God. By the way, that's what the true definition of grace is. Grace is an empowerment for you and I to walk in obedience to God. Amen. This cross offers a completely new way of life. As Paul declares in a different letter, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. Romans 6 and 4. This newness of life gives us the ability to walk away from what we previously could not. That is awesome. Think about this. This newness of life gives us the ability to walk away from what we previously could not. Sin's ty ty tyranny over us is broken, but we must choose to live it out. We e elect to give ourselves completely to his will. Paul continues to spell this out practically. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Galatians 5 and 24. And again, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Galatians 6 and 14. The cross empowers us to walk free from sin, sinful flesh and the strong influence of the world's system. The cross empowers us. As a young man, before I met Jesus, there were behavioral patterns in my life I could not put aside. I regretted my reoccurring hurtful, prideful, and lustful behaviors. But the more I tried to free myself, the more frustrated I became. I was hopelessly bound and subject to sin's dominion. However, once I was crucified with Christ, I could begin to live free. And I'm going to tell you something. Going back to what he's really trying for us to understand is how many people have made Jesus Savior, but haven't made them Lord. And they wonder why it is that they continue down the same behavioral patterns that, cause, that are hurtful and prideful and lustful. And they say, Pastor, I don't understand why it is that I keep doing these things over and over and over again. It's because we haven't come to the mindset, and it's, it's got to be here in our heart, that you're no longer a slave to that. And if, you, if Jesus is really Lord of your life, you have to make him Lord over that issue, over that sin. Does that make sense? You've got to give him lordship over that. And when you do, you can walk away from that. But you can't do it in your own strength. It's got, you've got to make Jesus more than just Savior. He's got to be Lord of every aspect of your life. Amen? We know that our old sinful, sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. That's Romans 6, 6 through 7. I hope you are not skimming over this. Drink the words in deeply, for they're very real and hold the power to your freedom. And I'm going to read them one more time. Really take in what I'm fixing to say. 
We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Hmm. The truth get, gets even more exciting. Embracing the cross does more than just free us from sin. It enables us to live obedient to him. We are told the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for the destruction, but we who are being saved know it to be the very power of God. 1 Corinthians 1 and 18. What was previously impossible to do in our own ability, we can now do walk in his ways. Hmm. We can now Im imitate, imitate, excuse me, God. We can now follow Jesus. To sum it up, it's impossible to follow Jesus without denying ourselves, hmm. forsaking our own ways and embracing his supreme authority and taking up the cross, incorporating its empowerment to walk away from sin and the world system. The life we now live is by faith in his ability working in us and through us. We draw from him what a glorious package of salvation God has provided for us. Amen. A solemn warning. Jesus warned that after his departure, a gospel would be proclaimed and widely accepted that would offer salvation apart from lordship. Did y'all hear that? I'm going to read that again. Jesus warned that after his departure, after he went to heaven, a gospel would be proclaimed and widely accepted that would offer salvation apart from lordship. Oh, and are we there today? The apostles were more specific and stated it would take place closer to the time of Jesus' return. That is our day. Amen. This widespread message would reduce Lord to merely a title rather than a position. Jesus holds in people's lives. Let me read, I'm going to read that sentence one more, one more time. It says, this widespread message would reduce Lord to merely a title rather than a position Jesus holds in people's lives. People will call him Lord, but deny, but will not deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. Read carefully Jesus' words, Matthew 7 and 21. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus identifies people who would declare him Lord, not Mohammed, not Joseph Smith, Buddha, Krishna, or any other false prophet of our error. No, these people would call Jesus Christ their Lord and say it with passion. Why did Jesus use the word Lord twice in this verse? We understand that when a word or a phrase is repeated in scripture, it is not accidental. The writer is communicating emphasis. However, in cases such as this, the duplication is not just for emphasis, but is to show intensity of emotion. For example, in the Old Testament, when when news reached King David about his son, son's execution by Joab's army, he responded with intense, intense, intensely emotional. And this is what it said. It said, but the king covered his face and the king cried out with a loud voice, oh, my son, Absalom, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son. 2 Samuel 19.4 I don't believe David's actually said my son twice. Rather, the writer repeated the words twice so the reader would understand just how 
highly charged David's cry of grief was. The same pattern appears in the book of Revelations. I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Revelations 8 and 13. Other translations state the angel was crying with a loud voice. Again, the writer repeats the word woe to emphasize a great intensity of emotion. In the same way, the master is communicating these people, people's strong sentiments for him. They are not merely in agreement with the teachings that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They are emotionally invested and passionate in their belief. We are talking about people who are excited to be Christians, most likely those who are emotionally when, or emotional when speaking of their faith and weep during a worship service. Not only do they feed, feel deeply for the cause of Christ, but they are also involved in service. Again, we're going to continue on with what Jesus says. It says, I can see it now. At the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me saying, Master, we preach the message. We bash the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. Matthew 7, 22 from the Message Bible. I use the Message Bible here because it best conveys the fact that these people weren't sideliners. They were directly involved in or supported the work of their churches. They were also outspoken in their beliefs of the gospel. We preach the message. They were a, they were a part of changing people's lives for the better. This paraphrased Bible version uses the word thousands. However, most translations use the word many. The Greek word is polis, polis defined as much of number, quantity, or amount. Often the word is used in the sense of mostly. In, the, in any case, Jesus is not referring to a small group of people, but a vast group. In fact, quite possibly a majority of the overall number. Did y'all get that? Basically what he's saying here is Jesus says many. And that word there would actually mean much of number, quantity, or amount. And in reality, it would mean a vast number of the group. And in fact, quite possibly could mean majority of the overall number. Overall number of what? Those that profess to be Christians. That goes right back to what Jesus said, is it? He says, broad is the way to destruction and many will find it. But narrow is the way to eternal life and few will find it. That's sobering to think that a lot of people today that are professing him as savior have not made him Lord. And when they stand before him, he's going to tell them, depart. I never knew you because they never made him Lord. Whew, what a sobering thought. So let's summarize. Jesus is speaking of people who believe in the teachings of the gospel. They call him Lord, are emotionally invested, give voice to the message, and are active in church services. We we would easily identify them as true Christians. So what sep what's the separating factor? How do they differ from the authentic believer? Jesus tells us, and then I will declare that to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7 and 23, part of my, script, part of my sermon from Sunday. The key statement is practice lawlessness, which is the Greek word anomia. Thayer's Greek English lexicon of the New Testament defines it as the condition of being without law because of ignorance of it or because of violating it. The Encyclopedia of Bible Words adds insight by, by stating that it can reflect action that are in active 
violation of either divine or intimate moral principles. Simply put, one who is lawless doesn't adhere to the authority of God's word. These men and women don't periodically stumble. Rather, they habitually ignore, neglect, or disobey God's words. Notice that what he said there. These men and women do not periodically stumble. Rather, they habitually ignore, neglect, or disobey God's words. If truly saved by grace, they not only despise the thought of sinning, but also choose to walk away from repetitive sin. They crucify their flesh with its passions and desires and pursue godly character and fruitfulness. It is interesting to note that Jesus will someday declare to them, I never knew you. This word knew is in the Greek is genoko, genokio, okay, yeah, genosko, <laughs> G-I-N-O-S-K-O, which means to intimately know. These people never had a true relationship with Jesus, even though they called him Master and Lord. It only was a title, for they did not what he said. The evidence that someone truly has a relationship with Jesus is that they keep his words. In 1 John 2, 3 and 4, it says, When we obey God, we are sure that we know him. That same word, know. When we obey God, we are sure that we know him. But if we claim to know him and don't obey him, we are lying and the truth isn't in our hearts. This is also James's implication when he writes, Show me how anyone can have faith without action, and I will show you my faith with my actions. That's James 2 and 18. And these statements also perfectly line up with the way Jesus began this entire dis discourse. You can identify people by their actions. That's Matthew 7 and 20. These actions Jesus speaks of are not Christian service, speaking the message, or attending church. For those who are turned away from heaven will have all of these qualities. Tim Keller ad addresses these words of Christ when he says, Now this is the saying something, now this is saying something incisive. These people have intellectually stimulated faith. They have emotionally gratifying faith. They have socially redeeming, redemptive faith. They all want that. We want to be intelligently stimulated. We want to be emotionally involved. We want to be socially useful. It's possible to want intelligent, intellectual stimulation to want emotional gratification, and to want social usefulness, but not want God. Let me go back and say that again. It's possible to want intellectual stimulation, to want emotional gratification, to want social usefulness, and not want God. Because if we really have God in your life, if you really have God, in your life, you have give you have to give up your own, and that shows the difference between someone who is actually trying to use God and trying to serve God. If we're willing to give up ourselves or give up our own, that shows the difference between one who is trying to use God and one who's trying to serve God. To use God is to seek Him for what He can, what we can get out of Him even if it's only to make it to heaven. To serve God is to be motivated entirely by our love for him. And if we love him, we will keep his words. Today, most would consider a person who calls Jesus Lord, believes in his teachings, is emotionally involved, and is active in Christian service to be a child of God. 
I've got to say, I've got to say that again. Today, most would consider a person who calls Jesus Lord, believes in his teachings, is emotionally involved, and is an act and is active in Christian service to be a child of God. Yet we've clearly seen from the words of Jesus that these qualities are not the deciding factor in identifying a true believer. Let me say it like this. You will certainly find these qualities in a true believer. In fact, a person cannot be a true believer without them. However, possessing these qualities doesn't mean someone is a genuine child of God. The deciding factor is this. Have they denied themselves, taken up their cross, and are they following him? In essence, are they obedient to his words? This description was Jesus' closing statement in his famous Sermon on the Mount. To put a cap on his startling words, he concluded, Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I like him to a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the rains blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the rain blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Matthew seven twenty four through 27 this parallel, oh, excuse me, parallel, this parable relates to his warning about the many who will deny entrance into heaven. For he connects them by saying, therefore. So basically, he continues on and connects them by saying the word, therefore. If you examine the two groups of people identified in this parable, it all comes down to one slight difference. Both hear the words, but the first group does them. The second group does not do them. Both houses are made of the same material, the same teaching. They both look identical in worship and in service. The critical difference is their foundation. One house was founded on the lordship of Jesus Christ. The other remains a attached to the, an evaluation of what was determined to be good and evil. The same tree of philosophy Adam and Eve turned to. It's sobering to think the same folly still repeats itself from, from the garden to the present day. It takes on a different form, but its roots are the same. Again, it comes down to this. Do we think we know best about how to live or do we believe that God knows what's best? So it all comes down to this. Do we think what we know, excuse me, do we think we know what is best about how to live or do we believe that God knows what is best? So as we know, and as we learn today, the foundation, our foundation has to be built upon the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I tell you, this is something, as I was even reading to, to you again, it, it's, it, it impacted me the second time that I, as I'm reading it to you again. This is a, a very, very stark reality. Unfortunately, this is exactly where we are as a church today. We're worried more about numbers than we are creating foundations for people's lives. You know, I often think and wonder sometimes when you see a big, huge, mega church, how many of them are truly followers or believers of Jesus Christ and have made him Lord of their lives. Those that have denied self, taken up a cross, or even in small churches. I believe what's taking place right now in the world today has a lot to do with what we're talking about right now. 
I know even in my own heart, months before this ever began, the Lord put in my heart that I will be separating the sheep from the goats. That message that the Holy Spirit dropped into my spirit was so what Jesus had said in Scripture. And the thing is, the reason he's separating the sheep from the goats, what does that really mean? He's separating those that have truly made him Lord and those that just confess him to be Lord or have only made him Savior. And that's something we really need to be thinking about. First to ourselves, have we truly made him Lord of our lives? And I pray today that's your, that's your prayer. If you today have the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart as we've read this, and as, you've, as the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, you feel in your spirit that you really haven't quite made him Lord. There are certain areas of your life that you continue to do. Or there are certain areas of your life that you know do not line up to the word of God. Or let's say you're, you, there are certain areas in, in scripture that you're not fully doing. You may be doing it partially, but you're not completely surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I ask you to make that right today before it's too late. The truth of the matter is we don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. It could be any time. But we don't want to be one that stands in him, look at us and say, you, I never knew you, though you were, had a, you were very passionate about what you believed, but what you believed was wrong. You were very passionate about what you believed was the salvation message, but unfortunately, it wasn't the message that I portrayed in Scripture. You did not follow and make me Lord. I never knew you intimately. I never knew you and you never knew me as Lord of your life. You never surrendered everything over to me and made my scripture, my word, as the defining factor of every decision that you made and the defining instructional pattern for your life. So I pray today that today you make Jesus the foundation Make him Lord of your life. Surrender everything to him today. Take up your cross and follow him in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Whew, what a word, Lord. This is one of those ones that I wouldn't be able to be still if I wasn't behind a desk. But Lord, it is so powerful for today. It is so right now. This is a right now word. Father, I believe what you're doing right now, even in the churches today, you are now fixing to begin that separation because I believe, Lord Jesus, you are coming soon and you will present a church that's without spot and wrinkle. I believe that. I believe, Lord, that you are separating the sheep from the goats even right now. When this is all said and done, I believe with all my heart the church will not look the same. But what I do believe will come out of this is you will have a remnant that truly call you Lord. And that's the remnant you're going to present to your father. That's the remnant that will come back and rule on this earth. Father, I am so thankful for your word today. I'm thankful to be able, as a pastor, to be able to read this today. Lord, this speaks as much to me and challenges me just as much as it challenges everybody who's on this viewing. And Father, I pray that it challenges them. And if it did, let them share it with somebody else. We don't want people lost because they don't have the truth. So Father, I just pray that you would allow this to just root in us. Father, if there's somebody today that don't know you, let them today, Lord, repent of their sins. Make you truly Lord of their lives. Submit their lives to your supremacy, your authority, your lordship. Let them turn away, confess their sins and turn away from those sins and begin to take their own cross and begin to follow you by your words. Only then can they truly become children of God. Lord, it really is simple. But Lord, it's not simple to do it. Taking up our cross and following you is not a simple task. But Lord, it's insignificant when you think of what you're giving us in the future, that we'll be able to spend eternity with you forever. 
be able to spend eternity with the Father, our Creator. I'm looking forward to that day. So I pray, Lord, your blessings over every family that's represented here on this TV, on these phones, however way that there is that they're watching this, Lord. I ask you to bless that family, protect that family, prosper that family. And Father, I pray that your peace, Lord, would be in their homes, but more importantly, in their hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my soon coming King, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Woo! I hope y'all enjoyed that as much as I did. If you did, please share it. I'm telling you, that right there is the fundamental, I believe, the fundamental flaw in the message today. I didn't say it. Jesus said, broad is the way that will lead to destruction. And Many will lead that. Many will go that direction. Just like the same many that will stand before him and call him Lord. But he said, narrow is the way that will lead to life. And I believe that narrowness is going to be those that truly make him Lord, that truly take up their cross and truly abide by his words. I love you. Look forward to tomorrow. Oh, I didn't give you what tomorrow's is. Let me let me look here real quick. Tomorrow, I like the title by the way. I already read the title. Is desire enough? Already sounds challenging, doesn't it? So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Let people know what's going on. Hopefully they can enjoy it too. Please share it, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. In Jesus' name, love you. God bless.